Good evening, I'm Delinda Maroka, KQED's Chief Audience Officer, and I'm so excited to welcome you here in person and those of you online to tonight's KQED Live in the Commons. I would like to begin our evening with a land acknowledgement. Here at KQED headquarters in the Mission, we are located on the occupied lands of the indigenous Ramatush and Ohlone people. We also honor and respect the many indigenous people still connected to this land. Please consider that as part of the reflection on how we all find ourselves at this place at this moment. Tonight's program will feature reporter Alice Wolfley here to interv interview Julian Brave Noisecat. KQED Live, you've been seeing the slides, is our newest uh, content platform. Now, many of you probably know KQED for another program. In fact, 2.6 million people, that's almost half all Bay Area adults, use a KQED service. For some people, that's listening to Forum on 88.5. Uh, for others, that's watching Check Please Bay Area on KQED 9. Still others listen to the Consider This podcast and others deep look videos. And now we have KQED Live, which is bringing a wide range of experiences in person. And they're all based on our mission to inform, inspire, and involve. It includes bringing our award-winning journalists here onto the stage with you, featuring local artists in performances and screenings, and really convening community, bringing to light issues important to the community and inspiring dialogue. So please check out all the events at kqbdd.org live. And all of this is possible, I really want to acknowledge two groups. First, our annual KQED sponsors, Asian Art Museum, Berkeley Rep, Comcast Business, and Oakland International Airport. We're so grateful for their support for the civic and cultural engagement. And I also want to thank our members, many of whom are here tonight. We have 250,000 supporters, one of the largest nonprofit um, member organizations in the Bay Area. And they tell us that they contribute to us voluntarily for a service that's free because they value it, but also because they want to ensure that it continues for generations to come. So thank you. We could not do any of this without your support. So let's get on with the program. I'd love to introduce our host tonight. Um, we have, uh, be, our, at our journey, before becoming a journalist, Alice Woofley worked as an educator, classical musician, and a sheep rancher. She honed her journalistic chops in Mendocino County, covering wildfires and reporting on cultural events and the economic challenges facing rural communities. She lives in Oakland with her boyfriend and their newborn twins. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Alice Woofley. Hello. This event this evening is about identity and family and connection to place. Tonight, we invite you to think about these questions. I'll read them for the visually impaired. There should be a slide up there. There we go. Um, what place do you feel connected to? And how does this place shape your identity? And how does the generation above you and below you in your family connect to this place? If you feel inspired, write your thoughts on some note cards which are being passed around, and we'll use some of your responses um, in the discussion following the talk. And also, if you have any questions for Julian, uh, write them on the cards. Our guest this evening is Julian Brave Noisecat. Julian is a prolific and compelling thinker. His work is inspired by the belief that the experiences and cultural knowledge of indigenous peoples can contribute to the understanding and addressing our world's most pressing problems. His writing appears in dozens of publications and looks beyond the usual scientific and political talking points around climate change. He examines the political systems and cultural beliefs that have contributed to the precarious moment we find ourselves in. Julian's work encompasses climate activism, indigenous culture, and personal history, bridging policy, art, and advocacy. His work is unique because it is both beautiful and important. Please welcome Julian Brave Noise Cat.
there a pandemic or something? Okay, uh, wait, call quite up. Uh, Julian Brave Noise Cat when squexed, when Kiaia disquest wa Antoinette Archie, et loot when Pepe disquest wa Ray Peters, et loot when Kiaia disquest wa Suzanne Roddy, et loot when Pepe disquest wa Joe Roddy, when Kikaha disquest wa Alexander Roddy, et when Kekacha disquest wa Ed Archie Noise Cat, se quachmuk en et statlimken, tetsk esken which dequen, the schmakwam which dequen. To Oakland, which deck one? Let one poopsman peen deceit cook lootkin to KQED, our public broadcaster. Ramatush aloni uluch wa echkuk, wa nik usum te squest wa yalamu. Met lachayim ken te kelmucha uwi toga yaust wa nakwa pepulks wa tamil. You guys got that, right? Okay. All right, good evening. <clears throat> I'm going to be telling some stories tonight, so just buckle up. I'm going to be talking for a while. Us Indians talk a lot. So I thought, it would be, I thought it would be appropriate to start tonight's event, Indigenous Peoples versus the Apocalypse in my language. That's the Sequetmuch language, which I was lucky enough to learn from my kia, my grandmother. She's the oldest person on the Canham Lake Indian Reserve and one of our last remaining fluent speakers. When she was a little girl, a government agent called an Indian agent took her and a bunch of other kids from Canham Lake away from their families on the back of a cattle truck to an Indian residential school called St. Joseph's Mission in Williams Lake, British Columbia. There, they were brutalized for speaking their language and taught to hate themselves for being Indian. Earlier this year, 215 unmarked graves were found at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. As the crow flies, Kamloops is about the same distance from Canham Lake as Williams Lake is from Canham Lake. Williams Lake is north, Kamloops is south. My Kia was sent to Williams Lake for grade school and Kamloops for her nursing degree. After the 215 graves were found in Kamloops, another 182 were found in Cranbrook, British Columbia, then some 751 in Maryville, Saskatchewan, 160 in Penalacket, British Columbia. Across the continent, First Peoples are now searching for the bones of our young ones at the schools that were supposed to civilize us. Now, over the last five months, I've been journeying to St. Joseph's Mission in Williams Lake, where they're using ground-penetrating radar to find my as friends, cousins, and classmates who never came home. I was there. I was there on September 30th, the first ever day of national truth and reconciliation in Canada, when the Williams Lake First Nation hosted a ceremony at their powwow arbor to remember and honor the survivors of the residential schools. Everyone wore orange shirts, which have come to represent all the things that the government, the church, the police, the schools, and dominant society took from indigenous kids. And among the orange-shirted Indians that day was Stan Wycott, 43-year-old former bull rider. You don't have many of those in the Bay Area. And a father of three. At 2.15, a time symbolic of the number of child-sized graves at Kamloops, drummers formed a big circle around the grassy arbor. Okay, it wasn't really 2.15 because we were running on Indian time, but it was supposed to be 2.15. And regardless of whether or not it was more like 2.30, we sung for the children, we sung for them, the ones who came home and the ones who did not. Now after that ceremony, Stan drove back to the res. He hung a right on Mission Road, the main thoroughfare connecting the highway to the Williams Lake Indian Reserve and St. Joseph's Mission. He changed out of his orange shirt and then he got some rope. 
and then in front of his family's house, he hung himself. A young man driving down Mission Road was the first to spot his dangling body. The next was his own nine-year-old daughter named Skyla. I drove by just minutes later in the Williams Lake Chief's car. The ambulance had arrived on the scene. Stan was lying on the ground receiving, Saint, receiving CPR. St. Joseph's mission has been closed for 40 years. But among my people, among the indigenous, its ledger runs long and it remains open. With Stan's death, the Wycotts have now lost three of their four biological children. Three of four. Who says any of this is history? Who says colonization is over? Certainly not us. Less than two weeks later, I was back in Williams Lake for Stan's end of life celebration. In the Wycott's house, Stan's body rested in an open casket beside a large portrait of a wiry cowboy in a buckskin hat. And I gotta tell you, he was handsome as a damn movie star. Stan's mother, Dolly, slept on a couch next to her son in that house every night. And every day she talked to him. She told him she loved him told him she missed him. Outside of that house, a sacred fire was kept burning for four days until Stan's burial. Stan's father, Chris, would sit out there before the sunrise, and every day I would join him to interview him, to visit, just to listen. It's important to listen. On the day of his son's services, we talked about the significance, the significance of that fire. How our people make offerings of sage, cedar, tobacco, and food to those in the next world through it. How our ancestors once wielded it to manage the forest, to draw out the game, and to renew the cycles of the earth. How all of that, what environmental scientists call a fire regime, you learned a new term today, what political scientists call self-determination, and what us indigenous peoples call freedom has been taken away. And now, the fires are out of control. In 2017, four blazes converged on Williams Lake. The city and reserve were evacuated and very nearly burned to the ground. In the hills around the Wycott's house, you can still see trunks spent like matchsticks on a hill as bald as a white man's head. This year, there were over 1,500 wildfires in British Columbia alone. The province, like this state and many other jurisdictions across North America, declared a state of emergency. Back home on the res, my family now spends summer afternoons looking out the windows at the ridge lines, searching for smoke and hot spots. My Kia's whole house is, is packed up. She gets evacuated basically every year. She has gas in her car so that she can run when it's time. As a little girl, she used to fear the schools. Now, she fears the fires. Sitting beside Stan's sacred fire, the fire that he eats through, I thought about what the world might be like if our land and our children had not been stolen, if our people did not live on the precipice of oblivion, if there weren't so many damn fires for dead Indians in a dying planet. I'm currently working on my first book and documentary. It's a big deal for me. And in both of those pro projects, I'm thinking through the convergence of apocalypses, the genocide of colonization, and the echo side of climate change. 
I'm trying to understand how indigenous peoples have persisted in the face of existential threats because I believe that our survival ought to matter to more people than just ourselves, that it ought to matter to you. So I chose to begin my keynote in my language tonight because I wanted to show you that in our words and in our very being, indigenous peoples are refusing to be annihilated. In a world that was supposed to march on into the future with us in the ground, we are daring to live. In Sekwet Mokhchin, I said who I am in relation to my kin, to my community, and to the places I come from. I didn't just honor my ancestors, I named them, and we brought them into this room. They're here with us right now, and I'm accountable to them. I love them just as I love and am accountable to future generations. That's how we do it. And someday, I too will be an ancestor loved by descendants I'll never meet. And you know what? I think that's beautiful. I think that rules, and I think that those sorts of relationships to ancestors and to relatives, they matter. And they don't just matter to us Indians, they matter to all people. At this dire juncture, with a pandemic engulfing humanity and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere climbing to levels not seen in 3.6 million years, we all need to remember who we are, how we are related, where we come from, and how the other than human world to which we are also related gives us life. Allow me to demonstrate. When I introduced myself, I said, my name is Julian Brave Noise Cat. And that meant something. Because Noise Cat, or Nawiskit, as the name was originally pronounced before the missionaries came down, wrote it up, and messed it up, it nearly died out. You see, at St. Joseph's, the missionaries baptized us with Christian names. Before then, our people carried ancestral names and earned names, what you might know as Indian names. And we could take on many, many in a lifetime. My late pa'a, my grandfather, for example, he had at least, I don't know, half dozen names, dozen names. He was born Raphael Norman Peters. He went by Raphael Norman Smith for some time to honor the guy who, who raised him as his own. And he cycled through just about every combination and permutation of those names. Ray Peters, Norman Smith, Ray, P Ray Smith, Norman Peters, et cetera, et cetera. Putting them on and taking them off depending on the year that it was the woman he was chasing or running away from or the trouble that he'd gotten himself into. He was also given an Indian name by his ancestors, by his elders. It was Kikitsa, which means day of the snake in Ukomisht. It's a language that I would love to learn. And the Litten Indians, our neighbors, they also gave him a nickname. It was Zeke, which according to my late uncle, and I don't know if this is true, but I think it's a great story, so I'm gonna tell you it anyways. According to my late uncle, Zeke means log lying down in the Litten Indians language. And that was really appropriate because my, my pa'a was lying down with, um, with a lot of women. <laughs> and I bet they gave him names too, but I don't, I don't know those names. This summer, my dad and I were talking about, about pa'a, about how crazy he was, about how crazy the stories of his life are. And we came up with another nickname for the old man, even though he's gone. Khan of the Caribou. Because in our little part of British Columbia, that crazy old Indian cowboy almost single-handedly repopulated the natives after a genocide. But for the government, for the church, men like my pa could not do. As they were claiming our lands for themselves, the government and church said, -uh, none of that. Us Indians, we could not be plural. We could only be individuals. They said, you Indians, 
You need one name so we can keep track of you, so we can confine you on those reservations, so we can count your dwindling numbers, and we can mark our control over your lives. They gave us names in their faith so they could save us from our supposed savagery, because when stealing and destroying are called civilizing and enlightening, maybe those acts can be justified by some people. In fact, they were so damn good at taking away names that when she died, my great-grandmother, Alice Nowiskat, was the last person, the last one, to carry her name. Alice raised my father when his own parents, who were all messed up from the residential schools, could not. She was a hard worker. He remembers her towing him out onto the family trap line so they could check the traps for frozen muskrat, for frozen beaver, so that they could sell their furs and feed their family. They did not have much. Hunger was common. But Alice, Alice was generous. One time, my dad remembers Alice finding a fresh apple. It's a hard thing to come by on the res. Even today, hard thing to come by. And she saved it. She saved it for my dad because she knew he loved them. And then one night in 1966, my dad remembers when Alice went out looking for her husband, Jacob, who was out drinking in a blizzard, and she froze to death. After Alice was gone, there were no noise cats in the whole world until my father married, reclaimed her name, and passed it on to me. And that one, it's a story for another time. Because let's be honest, have you ever heard of a marriage where the groom changed his name and not to his wife's name, and where the bride did not change hers? I bet you haven't. That's some unusual shit. That's some Indian ass shit. So what am I saying? I'm saying something pretty simple. I'm saying remember who you are. Be true to who you are. There is power in that. But also remember, and this is important, that the power of identity is not individual. It's not static. It's plural, it's collective, it's dynamic, and it's intergenerational. The next thing I did when I introduced myself in my language was I put myself in relation to my family and my people. And here, I should acknowledge, as a young person, that praising boomers probably isn't the best you know, thing to do given the mess that you guys have, have made. I mean, it's, it's a doozy. As young people, we've, we've certainly inherited far too many problems from, from your generation, climate change being just one among many. But that said, I believe that it's important to remember that we are not alone, that we have relatives, that we are in fact all related and not just us humans. You see, my family from Chamaquam, for example, we are black bears. And some of our neighbors out there in Chamaquam are frogs who are also homo sapiens. You see, us Indians, we maintain those interspecies relations. You guys might have forgot, but we did not. In my travels, I've interviewed Tlingits who are ravens and Tlingits who are eagles. I've met Oneidas who are turtles and others who are wolves. I've danced with Senecas who are snipes and Ohlone's who are coyotes. I've profiled artists who are whales and politicians who are adopted by the beavers. I've got one auntie who's a grouse and another who's a grizzly. I don't know if the scientists approve of us taking all these animals as our kin, but honestly, I don't really care. And in my high school biology, I learned that we share a whole heck of a lot of DNA with those animals, a lot more than you'd expect. And if we remember that, 
maybe we will recognize that our fates are also interrelated. Over the last five years, my father and I have participated in the tribal canoe journey. It's an annual indigenous gathering on the West Coast where tribal people organized into what are called canoe families get in their ocean going vessels and paddle for days and even weeks across the seas. At the end of those voyages, we converge on a single community for a week long celebration of food, gifts, speeches, dances, and songs. Now, my dad wasn't around for most of my childhood. He was struggling with alcoholism and the demons inherited from St. Joseph's and the cycles of poverty, dysfunction, addiction, and abuse that colonization unleashed on his home reserve, the one called Canham Lake, one of a few places I also call home. But the canoes and the canoe journeys they have brought us back together. And they helped us recognize the importance of family. You see, the beautiful thing about the canoe is that it quickly teaches you that if you want to go anywhere, you need other people. You need a family. Pulling alongside dozens of members of canoe families that welcomed us into their vessels with open arms, my father and I have traveled across international borders. We've traveled across hundreds of miles of ocean. We've made countless friends, learned dozens of new songs, and visited many, many magical places. We've been inspired. And in 2019, we were inspired to bring the canoe journey here to Alcatraz Island. You see, that year marked the 50th anniversary of the Alcatraz Occupation, a 19-month protest for indig indigenous self-determination, sovereignty, and treaty rights. Now, I need you to understand how important the Alcatraz Occupation was to indigenous peoples. It's like our version of the Montgomery bus boycott. It launched a social movement that changed the hearts and minds of native and non-native people across the country and around the world. And it transformed federal policy. During the occupation, President Richard Nixon, the Watergate guy, the friggin' Watergate guy, he shifted the federal government's policy from an officially stated goal of termination to one of self-determination. And by the way, that's what American Indian policy was actually called in these United States. It was called termination. And the goal was to eliminate tribes by separating children from their families and their people from their communities and their land. Lawmakers discussed it, they agreed to it, they refined it, they budgeted for it, they passed laws to achieve it, and they oversaw its implementation. And at Alcatraz, we said, Enough is enough, and we put an end to that. Now, back to the canoe journeys. Working with our own canoe family, which we called appropriately the occupied canoe family, my father, my mother, and a group of friends that included a youth worker and an Alcatraz occupation veteran named Eloy Martinez, who's here tonight, by the way. Eloy, raise your walking stick. Together, we organized a paddle around Alcatraz Island on Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019. 18 canoes, including some as far north, from as far north as Canada and some from as far west as Hawaii participated in that paddle. Dozens of media outlets covered the story, including, of course, KQED. Another local TV station broadcast the canoes circumnavigating the island from its traffic helicopter. Our little vo all-volunteer effort even made it into the New York Times. And for a day, all the way over on the East Coast, people eating their bagels with a schmear glimpsed Alcatraz the way indigenous people see it. As a morbid, barren, craggy prison, a lot like a reservation, honestly, that has been reclaimed as a symbol of indigenous freedom. We can do a lot together 
when we recognize the fact that we need relatives, that we need family. Now, every time my father and I get out onto the water, we rekindle and deepen our connection to the seas and places that gave us our Salish culture, that gave us the language I spoke to you earlier. And in my introduction, I also told you where I come from. Canem Lake, called Tzikeschen in our language. Shamaquam, a village of the Liwat nation. And Oakland, the town by the bay that raised me. I also acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you in San Francisco, a village once called Yalamu by the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the first peoples of this place. It was a very cosmopolitan land acknowledgement, one that I think demonstrates how ubiquitous indigenous dispossession is in this hemisphere. Every place I mentioned was fundamentally shaped by dispossession, by taking the lands, by taking the kids. After visiting her childhood home in the East Bay, another Oakland writer who you probably heard about a lot more than me, once famously wrote that there is no there there. It's a bit of an overused and misquoted phrase, but I think the feeling of dislocation it conveys has endured because so many of us are losing meaningful relationships to our home and to our place. I mean, just look around San Francisco and the Bay. We are unmoored. We are drifting on the tides of capitalism from gig to gig, from apartment to apartment, and from Zoom call to Zoom call. And I think, I think that untethering is dangerous because if we don't stop to remember and honor, honor the places we come from and rely upon, to insist as my friend, another great Oakland writer, Tommy Orange does, that there is a there there, how can we possibly defend these places? Now, earlier this year, I was asked to write an essay for the Paris Review celebrating the Kiowa author N. Scott Mamaday, who was the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And while reporting that piece, I discovered that Mamaday actually taught one of the original student leaders of the Alcatraz occupation. Her name was Lenata Warjack, and in 1968, she became the first Native American at UC Berkeley. And even though Mamade could literally see Alcatraz from Berkeley, he never got involved with the Alcatraz occupation or the Native rights movement directly. I thought that was very cur curious. But what I also thought was curious was that Warjack told me that his lectures influenced her profoundly. So in my reading, reporting, and writing, I set out to understand the ethic at the core of Mamaday's work, the worldview it grew out of, and the movements it continues to influence, the movement that Lenata helped start. And rereading Mamaday's books, I noted a brief postscript in my 2010 edition of the Pulitzer Prize-winning Housemaid of Dawn. It reads, quote, both consciously and subconsciously, my writing has been deeply informed by the land with the sense of place. In some important way, place determines who and what we are. I am Tsekeskenem. I am a person from Canem Lake, a place we call broken rock in our language. I have ancestors who are bears from Shamaquam, but I am also a son of Oakland in the Bay Area. I am, like all of you, a guest of the Ohlone. My connection to those places and others is also an imperative. It demands that I remember, honor, and protect those patches of earth. And now that we are in dialogue and relation, I believe you are asked to do the same. Now, you might be thinking that, geez, this guy sounds exceptionally proud of being Indian. The truth is actually a little more complicated. My mother's white, an Irish Jewish New Yorker. The language I spoke at the beginning of this talk 
I didn't learn it until college when I got a grant from a fancy university to spend the summer back home in Cannon Lake. In Cannon Lake, it's a community I did not grow up in. I didn't fish my first salmon run until I was 20. In fact, when I was a little boy, my dad was really freaked out because I was allergic to salmon, my ancestors' plentiful staple food. Imagine that, little native kid whose people ate, survived on salmon, couldn't eat it, threw up every time. I've only ever tagged along for a hunt, I've only shot a gun once, and sometimes I wonder when I see a moose out in the woods, which is a very uncommon thing, but once in a while you do see them, I wonder if I'd even have it in myself to kill it. I barely know how to make and keep a fire like the ones the Wycots kept for Stan. And I'd be in serious trouble, like maybe life-threatening trouble, if someone asked me to chop some wood. For my grandparents and my dad, school was a nightmare. I can't emphasize this to you enough. It was a conspiracy, a literal real world conspiracy where they deprogrammed, assaulted, raped, and even killed little Indian kids. But for me, school was a ticket to ride. I sat in front of the class. Now, I was raised with some ideas and values I talked about tonight. Don't get me wrong, I've done some pretty damn Indian shit. But mostly, I've spent my life trying to recover the things I lost when my father walked out the door when my kia was kidnapped and taken to St. Joseph's, when my great-grandmother Alice froze to death. This name I carry, Noise Cat, Nawiskit, no one even remembers what it means. Some missionaries just came along and they chucked it into the dumpster of history. It's hard to be discarded. It's hard to be told that your life, your story, is not worth remembering. That is our lot as Indians in this society. So if I sound proud, it could be that I just desperately, desperately want us to matter. So with humility, here's what I think I'm saying. What I'm thinking through in the book I'm writing, the film I'm making, and the oral tradition I'm joining. I'm saying that a broader humanity facing the apocalypse of climate change might have a thing or two to learn from a people who've survived the near total loss of our own worlds. That, I, I don't know, maybe a society that's burning down half the continent could learn something from ancestors who knew how to live without burning down half the continent. That at the very least, indigenous peoples have something important to say if you're willing to give us an audience like you all have so generously given me tonight that there might be ways that your humanity and our collective future can be brightened if you have it in your heart to believe that the civilizing mission was wrong, that the St. Joseph's of the world had it all backwards, that in fact, in the long run, it's all of you that might have something to learn, something small from all of us that maybe America, Canada, and the so-called civilized world could stand to become just a little bit, just a little bit more indigenous rather than the other way around. The United Nations says that climate change is nothing less than code red for humanity. It is already brutalizing many of the places we come from and rely upon. It is driving us apart making us forget that we are not just interconnected, but interrelated. We are all kin. And if we're not careful, climate change is going to make us forget who we are. Animals of remarkable intellect, capable of immense care and compassion, even when the gravest injustice has laid us low. 
So my message for you and maybe also myself tonight is simple. Remember who you are. Remember that you have many relatives, human and non-human. And remember that we all come from somewhere and that those places and the place called earth need us to fight for them. Chuk, that means, that's all I have to say. Chuk, eth kutk I am so, so grateful to our public broadcaster, KQED, for this opportunity. My hands go up to KQED, and I sincerely, sincerely look forward to the rest of tonight's conversation with Alice Wolfley. Our conversation in the green room was great, and if it's anything like that out here, it'll be worth you sticking around. And I certainly look forward to all of your questions and to meeting many of you after the Q&A. Cooks Jem. Thank you for telling your story. <laughs> Thanks for, for being here. Um, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful. Um, one thing that really struck me, you know, you say that it's the so-called civilized world might want to continue, uh, like consider becoming more indigenous. And the two, two of the main things that I think of when I hear you say that are something that you mentioned is the sort of um, management of fire in the Western landscape. And another thing is um, the indigenous ideas around gender identity. And I know that there are many other examples. Um, do you want to talk about a couple of those? Yeah, so, um, well, firstly, thank you so much for agreeing to join tonight as the interviewer. Alice actually wrote, um, or well, produced and recorded a, a really wonderful podcast episode for KQED uh, about the Bay. Yep. The Bay podcast. Fantastic KQED podcast. <laughs> and it was about the uh, canoe journey that we organized in 2019. It's still on the, the internet. If you want to, I'll take, give it a listen. Um, and she's also a wonderful journalist whose work I, I really, really enjoy. Um, you know, to your question, I think that there are sort of broadly speaking, I'd say, um, sort of two categories that I think about when um, communicating the kinds of ways that indigenous knowledge and indigenous peoples might be able to contribute to uh, the so-called civilized world or to, you know, sort of the broader challenges that that we face today. And, and the one subset of them is um, essentially like policy and, and management and self-governance questions. And that's largely where I'd put uh, things like, you know, fire management, or I'd put things like environmental stewardship and indigenous management of fisheries and forests and things of that nature. Um, and then the other, I think, is a little bit less, you know, directly policy oriented or technocratic. And those are, I think, um, questions of how we might approach culture and society and social relations essentially differently the way that other indigenous and, and some non-indigenous societies did. And one of the ones that I think is particularly, um, I, I guess I just find it particularly moving is, uh, you know, among the Diné, the Navajo people, they recognize more than just the the sort of two binary genders that were long sort of the only ones recognized in Western society. And actually in, in their creation stories, um, those genders played essential roles in, in making the world what it is today. And I think that that kind of relationship to forms of difference and forms of identity and just that ability for people to self-determine and self-express and be who they are 
you know, I think that that's a really powerful thing. There's actually a really big book out now by this guy named David Graeber and another anthropologist named David Wengro, where the whole argument is essentially that because people in indigenous societies could vote with their feet and could, you know, experiment with all sorts of different social norms, all of these different political formations and and social relationships emerged over time. And I think that, you know, I would agree with their thesis. And I think one thing that I, you know, believe and try to communicate about is that those things are worth revisiting and and valuing and maybe reviving in in today's society and world. Yeah. Um another thing that that comes to my mind when you talk about sort of, you know, I guess Western culture or colonial colonial culture, <laughs> the, the culture that colonized the native people, um, that could be learned from the, the native is the the relationship with uh, the non-human relatives. I um, I used to be a sheep rancher, and I considered my flock of sheep like part of my extended family, and the dogs that helped me with my sheep as part of my extended family. Um, and I also considered the land that my sheep were on, you know, as very important to me. I was very closely connected to it. And, um, you know, they sheep ate the grass and I ate the sheep. And so, therefore, the land was directly supporting me, <laughs> you know, physically. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I considered them to be part of my extended family. And I think that people that have a very strong connection to animals, even if they're domestic animals, not, you know... Um, wild animals, uh, when you have connection to animals or to place, it really, you become invested in that place being healthy and you become invested in the threats that are facing that place. The place that I'm very connected to, which is up in Mendocino County, is threatened by uh, drought. All the big oak trees are dying and the bay trees are dying. And it's also threatened by development and it's threatened by fires, of course. And um, I have uh, three month old twins at home. I'm a, I'm a new mom. and I don't know what their relationship to this place is going to be. Um, I don't know if we'll have access to that place. Who's going to own that place? You know, are we going to be able to visit? So it's, you know, it's something that, that I think about and I relate to. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think firstly, another form of relation that's really important is being a mother. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my mom is also here tonight. So I Aww. just want to say that... <laughs> very happy for you congratulations that's really thank beautiful. you <laughs> um and yeah and i think that the what you what you brought up with that about um sheep farming and the relationship to the land you know i think that what's i think different about that sort of environmental framework from the one that you know is maybe more associated with the Sierra Club and conservation and those sorts of things, right? It's not that the environment is like, you know, this place that is distant from us that needs to be kept distant from us. And, you know, that's what protection looks like. I think that there's another form of, you know, deep embeddedness in ecology and the essentially the place you are from and where you live and, you know, De, the you know deriving of your life and your sustenance from it that I think creates a much deeper attachment and you know I mean it's that kind of relationship that I think explains why in many instances the people who are laying their bodies on the line to protect so many places like you know Standing Rock like Oak Flat in Arizona like so many spots in the Amazon and around the world are indigenous peoples. They're not, you know, hikers. They're not conservationists. I mean, conservationists, don't get me wrong, they're good. But it's it's a there's a different kind of when it's part of who you are and how you live, I think there's a different kind of attachment. And that kind of relationship and attachment creates an imperative to protect and defend that I think is important and valuable and something that is already starting to have, you know, impact in the broader way that people who are non-native are starting to rethink how we should be conceptualizing 
environmentalism and how we, you know, protect the natural world or whatever we want to call it when we don't call it the natural world anymore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, I guess also so much of our population is is urban, you know, and people's connection to nature is is very different from what it used to be. Um, you know, my grandparents, they raised chickens in their backyard, they hunted, they fished, um, they spent, you know, all of their summers on the lake and at the ocean. And um, that's just something, you know, maybe some kids go to camp and spend some time in the woods and they're afraid of bugs and whatever. But <laughs> um, I think that we are becoming increasingly detached. And um, yeah, I mean, the, the lives that our grandparents lived are pretty different from the lives that, you know, my babies will live once they grow up. Um, and that also gets me thinking about an aspect of your work, which, you know, you, you talk so much about um, your family history and, uh, you know, the history of, of Native people in general. And um, you also, as like a climate activist and a writer, are really looking forward. And to me, it seems that, you know, those two are very connected. The, the sort of the past and the future are connected. Yeah, well, so I just want to respond to one thing, and then I'll get to the the past and the future relationship. One thing that I observed actually this summer, and it I, it really struck me most when I was in Alaska, but I've also come to see it a little bit more in the part of British Columbia that my family is from, is that on the one hand, there's no part of the the world that isn't touched by humanity with climate change and all these other you know, uh, enormous ecological breakdowns that we're living through. But on the other hand, because of the way that in particular indigenous peoples, but other people were too, were uprooted from the places where we were living on the land. This is very evident in a place like Alaska, where there were literally, I was in Southeast Alaska and the Tlingit used to have dozens of village sites throughout Southeast Alaska that they'd travel to at particular times of year and, you know, that they, you know, maintained stories about, they knew which ones were good for what kinds of fishing, et cetera. And as colonization unfolded, they were uprooted from those places and increasingly collected in particular places where, you know, the government was and the church was so that they could be controlled. And one of the broader outcomes of that is that yes the the earth is touched by humanity everywhere now but also the earth is a lot more lonely than it used to be there's there's lots of parts of the land that don't get visits from people the way that they used to they don't get used by people they don't get fished they don't get hunted they don't get gathered upon by people in the same way that they used to and so there's this weird um sort of dual forces that are happening of people not being on the land as much and but at the same time the land being increasingly just pillaged by broader humanity um and i guess you know i obviously i talk quite a bit about indigenous peoples and indigenous culture and indigenous history and you know what i find very common among the various people and communities that I get to report on and visit with and hear from as I travel around and get to do my work is this very, you know, on the one hand, I would say mostly positive outlook on the future, but an outlook on the future that is markedly different from the one that you often hear from, you know, Western society and modernity. It's an outlook on the future where people are hopeful because they see their kids picking up more of the traditions and ways and language and practices of their ancestors. Their outlook on the future is, hey, we're actually reclaiming and getting back to the good ways that we had before, right? And I think that that vision of what progress or success looks like where you know it's about living up to the mantle that you've inherited from your ancestors that there are good things that can be revived from the past and the present is a, just a much different vision of what the future could be and can look like than the one that you know most often 
is paraded forward by Silicon Valley and 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 sort of the technologists and the people who dominate visions of the future. And I think that there's something actually really hopeful in the idea that there were good, beautiful things that humans came up with in the past that we can maybe try to bring into the future, that it's not all stuff that we have to invent, you know, out of our out of our brains, that it's stuff that we can actually get back to. Well, and that goes back to the idea of, you know, looking to traditional knowledge. You know, there's there's so much science that's, oh, we've discovered that, you know, people didn't cross the land bridge. And and then Native people say, yeah, we knew that we were telling you that, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, different things about plants and animals that is um, very old, old Native knowledge that is now being proved by science. <laughs> um, I do want to say if you have questions or you wanted to respond to the prompts early, um, maybe they've been collected, but we're gonna, we're gonna take them soon. Um, yeah, um, I loved your, uh, your quote from N. Scott Mombaday, what happens to the identity when, uh, or, I mean, uh, in some important way, place determines who and what we are. And I've been thinking about, you know, what, what happens to the identity that's connected to a place when the place changes? And it's kind of a very open-ended question. Um, and it could go in, in so many different directions. And that's, again, looking to the past, how previous generations interacted with a place and what does the place look like now? What's it going to look like in 50 years? And what are you know those future generations going to experience it as? Yeah, one of the things that I wanted to that I, I'm not sh totally sure how to talk about quite yet. So I'll, I guess I'll talk about it on stage here before I write it down somewhere and regret it. Um, but essentially one of the ironies I think about the fact that Mama Day was at UC Berkeley and that the indigenous movement was started by native people who were in cities, right? Like these were, Native students at UC Berkeley, at San Francisco State, these were Native people who were sent on the relocation from reservations to cities, is that they're urban, right? And they're talking about the importance of treaty rights and self-determination and lands that are not here for most of them. They're back home in, you know, Laneda's... Uh, for Leneda, it's in Idaho. For Richard Oaks, the late Richard Oaks, one of the other student leaders of the Alcatraz occupation, it's up in, in upstate New York, and so on and so on. And I think that there's something actually kind of similar to diasporic communities in that. There's a irony to me in the fact that the political attachments to place, to homelands, are strengthened most when people are dislocated actually to cities, when they come to places like Oakland and San Francisco and form new urban communities. And in those urban communities, they say, firstly, we're going to maintain who we are and we're going to create a new attachment to this place that is also just as authentically indigenous as our attachments to the places back home. But also, here, it's our responsibility to fight for people back home with the, the visibility and, and education that we might be afforded here in the city. And so I think that there's, I don't, I don't know totally what to do with that, but you know, I, I, I guess I also see myself in that kind of light, right? I grew up in Oakland. I, as I said, I did not grow up in Canham Lake. I feel the responsibility as a person who is going to be buried at Canham Lake to defend that place and to defend the places that I come from and I have attachments to those places. But I also think that my attachment to this place, to the Bay Area as an indigenous person, is also a form of indigeneity that is important and needs to be honored. And ironically, it was in cities like this that the political resurgence that brought us back to, hey, we need to defend our homelands and our treaties and those things began. Um, and I haven't seen that many people write about and talk about that, but it's something that I'm trying to to wrestle with because I think that it's 
it's it's another way in which you know our story is very much alive in the present our our story is very much um you know it didn't it didn't end in the 1800s when we were confined on these reservations it it was renewed in a very sort of fascinating way when we came to 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 places where people thought that we we're just going to dissipate into the body politic and where we didn't belong and where we weren't going to be Indians anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we have some questions. Okay. This is a question for you. Could you speak to the idea that we are all indigenous to somewhere, yet obviously do not all belong to the communities that have been forcefully ripped away from those places? How do we respect those multitudes of overlapping? Uh, I'm gonna say identity because I can't quite read <laughs> the word, the handwriting. <laughs> yeah, so I this is something that um, I think that, that uh, in New Zealand, there's a, a very strong indigenous movement uh, because the Maori are just a much larger portion of the society. They're about 15% of the population of New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand also is called Aotearoa, uh, and it, one of its founding documents is actually the considered the Treaty of Waitangi, and it's considered a bicultural, officially bicultural nation where the Maori, the indigenous Maori, and the Pakea, as they're called in the Maori language, the English settlers are considered the two founding peoples of the nation. And one of the interesting ways that I think the sort of culture in New Zealand has grappled with this history is that more and more Pakea or, or, or settlers, people who are not indigenous to New Zealand, um, uh, and in particular, I would say, say white people in New Zealand have come to sort of start re-emphasizing, I guess, their own particular um, sort of European cult countries of origin. And I think that that might sound, I mean, there are ways obviously in which like, you know, Italian Americans marching for Christopher Columbus is obviously not my thing. <laughs> um, but I think that there is something in the very basic move to, I guess, refuse the very thorny place of whiteness and to like attach yourself to something slightly different and to acknowledge that there's something particular there um, that I, I think might be a way around and thinking through that. And, you know, as someone who's, whose ancestors partially hail, I guess, from, from the old country, uh, you know, that is something that I, I'm also increasingly interested in. I want to, I have, I have, uh, my Roddy ancestors are from County Roscommon. And, uh, you know, I think that like, that's obviously not a huge part of the things I talk about, but like, I would like to go back and touch that wood someday. I like how you refer to the just generic, the old country. <laughs> um, Here's, a, here's an interesting question. Um, what is your advice to people who have lost their connection to previous generations and have no children? You know, I think one of the beautiful things that, you know, happens at the Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland, it's on um, International Boulevard in, in East Oakland, is that there are all these people who at least when I was growing up, you know, would show up and we'd call them auntie or granny so-and-so. And, -so. and um, most of the time, none of those people were biologically related. But in that community, you know, we were related. We we treated them as though we were related. You know, I, I consider Eloy, who is not my blood relative to be my relative. I consider him to be my uncle. We treat him like, you know, he's, he's an uncle. And this, I mean, this is really simple, but I think that those kinds of deep relationships are things that if you look at like surveys, for example, of people, you know, 
if they're asked to say, you know, whether they they trust their neighbors. If you look at the survey responses today, a lot fewer people trust their neighbors than would have, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And I think that at a very basic level, you know, we are a species that prefers, or I think our heart prefers to live in community. And one of the things that I think, you know, I see Native people doing, whether it's here in Oakland or, or back on the res, is we really do the community thing. And we do it in a way that community is like family. And there are people in our community who we treat and take in as our family. And, you know, so I think that there are lots of ways if you, you know, decide to participate in, to be part of community, to have that kind of kinship uh, that don't require, you know, literal biological relation. There's also your non-human relatives. Yeah, I have dogs too. <laughs> dogs, cats, <laughs> sheep. Um, okay, well, I'm going to read. Um, we have a couple of people that responded to the prompts about place, and um, I have two that are, are really lovely, so I'm going to read them. Um, As someone who grew up across multiple countries and cultures, I feel most connected to micro places. My parents' balcony in our apartment in Beijing, the neighborhood. Uh, Sorry, I'm trying to read the handwriting. <laughs> um, the neighborhood down my street in suburban Los Angeles, the rooftop I lived on for three years in Berkeley, these snippets together form my eclectic identity, pieced together from a multitude of influences never quite belonging. While generations before me do not share these same micro places, I feel a number of my family members' identities and experiences were framed by comparable threads uh, of their own micro places, from Chinese warehouse to a German, a German spa town. In this shared experience, I find comfort and solidarity. And. in response to what place do you feel connected to? This land, its fiery ecosystem, my fighting spirit, its abundance, my creativity, and the gifts of life here. Its diversity, the diverse cultures and lived experiences that shaped my perspectives, the way I see the world. San Jose, California, of Ohlone Muk Mukemwa, of Cambodia, Muwekma. of Earth. Sorry? It's Muwekma. Thank you. Of Cambodia, of earth, water, fire, air, light, and darkness of stardust. Thank you so much for your questions and your um, connections to place. Um, I just want to—I want to close by um, talking about a couple of encouraging things that I have heard of in my reporting happening in California, and just to sort of look forward with some hope that we're seeing in native communities. I know up north in Mendocino County, Ukiah High School has a class on Pomo language and culture. And the Hoopa also have a language program for little kids. And I believe they also have a, a summer program, language program. And the Klamath Dam is coming down. And you know, um, we're starting to acknowledge and uh, learn about the fire management systems of native people. And um, do you see a, a native renaissance these days? Absolutely. I actually think, now that you mentioned the Hoopa thing, I think that my friend Sarah Chase from undergrad actually is one of the teachers in the Hoopa language program. Um, so I guess the my just quick response to that would be, yes, there's a lot of... I mean, I, I talked about some heavy stuff today, but the other side of that is that you know, we're still here and we're still remembering and honoring who we are. And I think in that there is proof in our in our being that there can be beauty on the other side of just earth shattering things that have happened. And I think that that human capacity for resilience, which now is, I think, in many places, a, a renaissance where Native people are reclaiming language, relearning language, reclaiming culture, and in some places actually literally getting our land back, I think that that is a hopeful, beautiful story, one that I hope more people are going to tune into and pay attention to. Um, and also, 
it's such a small world, Indian country is such a small world that like, you know, one out of four of the things you mentioned are, I, I like actually have like a relationship to, and it's so cool to be, It's I can't emphasize this enough, I think it's so cool to be part of a community where not only is that what's happening, but like I could name some of the people who are doing some of these things. And that to me, I don't know. I mean, I, I just feel so lucky to be part of that. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for being here. <laughs>